you've probably heard the old adage, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And that's kind of true. I mean, sometimes you can go somewhere and, and they'll give you actually a free lunch. You know, you show up, you listen to a talk, they give you a sandwich, maybe a bagel. You didn't pay for the food, but it's there. And the idea behind that is somebody paid for it. It wasn't really free. Um, but the reason I'm bringing this up is, is that there really is nothing free in life. Everything runs up a bill. You know, even if you're sitting there doing nothing, of course you're not doing nothing, you're alive. And living is a fairly active process. So even when your neurons are resting, doing nothing, uh, they're not really doing nothing. There's still ions moving down their concentration gradients, and we've got to spend ATP to move them back. There's nothing that's free. We're always running up a bill. And the way that we pay the bill uh, at the molecular level is through ATP production. So we're going to make ATP from glucose, that's the big story today, and we're going to use that ATP to fuel a whole bunch of different things in the neuron. And by a whole bunch of different things, I mean everything. The bulk of that is really all about moving ions back against their concentration gradient, so the ion pumps. And there's a variety of these. The major ones to know would be the sodium-potassium ATPAs, calcium ATPAs, and then there's proton pumps that are going to be a whole lot more important next lecture when we talk about uh, neurotransmitter synthesis and packaging in vesicles. Now the way that we generate our cash, that is ATP, to pay the bill is through metabolism. And in the brain that's almost exclusively the breakdown of glucose into uh, pyruvate through glycolysis, so that would be our anaerobic metabolism, and then the breakdown of uh, pyruvate into carbon dioxide, and a whole bunch of ATP. That's going to be our aerobic metabolism. Glycolysis is going to take place in the cytoplasm, and, and it seems it's going to happen more so in astrocytes, and the aerobic metabolism is going to take place in the mitochondria, and it seems more so in neurons. And this makes sense because neurons are a more expensive cell, and astrocytes are better connected to the blood, thus they're going to get the glucose first and have time to undergo glycolysis before they pass over the pyruvate to neurons. That's going to be the focus in the third part here when we talk about those metabolic substrate shuttles. We're going to be moving things from astrocytes to neurons. And then we'll talk about how we scale the amount of blood flow to different areas of the brain based on their level of activity. Because if neurons are active, they're generating a bill. They need uh, more ATP, thus they need more glucose and oxygen, which means they need more blood flow. So how do the blood vessels know when neurons have been active? That's the last part of this talk. So let's take a moment and, and re refresh ourselves on the ion gradients and how we maintain them with pumps. <clears throat> so we have that ionic imbalance uh, that we've talked about in a few lectures now. There's a lot of sodium and chloride outside, a lot of potassium inside. <clears throat> the way that we create this is, of course, with pumps that are going to move ions against their concentration gradient to establish that imbalance. And if you're only going to know one, you should probably know the sodium-potassium ATPase. But you should probably know more than one. <clears throat> now the brain is going to use a whole lot of energy, especially relative to its mass. So even though it's only about 2% of the mass, it's going to use about a fifth or a quarter of the oxygen and glucose that's moving throughout our body. And that glucose is going to be the primary energy source. The reason that we believe this is because of the uh, respiratory quotient. So if you were to measure the amount of oxygen going in, so if you measure arterial oxygen and then venous carbon dioxide, you can look at the rate of oxygen utilization and carbon dioxide production. You'll see they're about the same. And that suggests that we're taking in glucose and breaking it down to carbon dioxide. <clears throat> now the reason that neurons are going to be so greedy with their energy is because of their intricate morphologies. All those little extensions that they put out are going to increase its surface area to volume ratio. So all the branching, all the spines and the dendrites, all the branching of the axon as well, that's going to branch off. All of that membrane is, of course, lined with protein. And a lot of these proteins are going to be ion channels. So we're going to be moving ions pretty much throughout the entirety of the cell surface, except for myelinated regions of the axon. But other than that, we should consider the neuron filled with ion channels. So this high surface area to volume ratio is going to mean that we have a lot of ion channels that we have to build 
building proteins is not free, transporting proteins is not free, and of course moving the ions, even though those are passive gradients, not free. If you compare the surface area to volume ratio between just a, or a typical little kind of columnar epithelial cell versus a motor neuron, you can see a whopping difference shown over here. So I've just done some uh, ballpark calculations here from a few different sources. Big difference in their surface area to volume ratio. Not surprising. <clears throat> Far more intricate morphology, basically just a box. So here's your epithelial cell. These are designed to just form a sheet. That's it. Neurons are designed to receive diverse input and project over long distances to communicate. So they're greedy. Now if we break down where they're spending their energy, most of it is going to go to those postsynaptic uh, potentials and the receptors that mediate them that we talked about in the last lecture. After that, we got basic housekeeping. All right, that's keeping the cell alive. That's making proteins. That's transporting them around. That's taking care of the mitochondria. Then we have about equal usage for resting potentials and action potentials. This is assuming about a 3 hertz firing rate in cortical neurons. So it varies. Action potentials can take up a whole lot more energy if you're more active or less if you're less active. And of course, the distance that your axon projects, how much it branches, it's variable. These are definitely ballpark figures. After that, we have our presynaptic release of neurotransmitter. That's going to include the recycling of vesicles and the fusion of vesicles. And then there's the reuptake and the packaging of neurotransmitters. And both of those are going to take about 5% each. So, it all really comes down to how active is the neuron. Because that's going to change its bill. If you fire more action potentials, that 15% part of the pie wedge is going to increase and you need more ATP as a result. If you receive more postsynaptic input, that part of the pie wedge is going to increase as well. So activity requires ATP. The more active the cell, the more ATP it needs. <clears throat> now the way that we're going to uh, do anything in a neuron is, is really by moving ions down their concentration gradient. And that means we need to establish these concentration gradients. So anytime you open an ion channel, ions are going to move in accordance with those two forces. The, the diffusive force and the electrical force. But we're going to get a movement of ions, and it's going to be passive. So in general, what we're going to be doing is moving down our concentration gradient. For example, sodium flows in, potassium flows out. So you open a non-specific cation channel, and cations are moving in both directions, basically down their concentration gradient. That means we need pumps to move them back across their concentration gradient. So we're going to be moving up. That's of course not passive and so we have to spend ATP. So that sodium that came in and the potassium that left through the non-specific cation channel, well we got to pump that sodium out and pump the, the potassium in. That's what the sodium potassium ATPase does. So we'll spend one ATP, take out three sodium, bring in two potassium. So it's electrogenic. It's creating a negative charge. It's going to help establish the, the negative membrane potential because of this and also because of the ionic imbalance that it establishes to make sure that potassium's reversal remains negative. There are other pumps, though. Of course, the, the, the calcium ATPase is going to be there. So after we have calcium come in, we stimulate neurotransmitter release. We want to get rid of it. So we've got to pump calcium uh, out of the cell or into uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, we got to get it out of the cytoplasm. We got to move it against its concentration gradient. There are proton pumps that we're going to talk about <clears throat> that are going to create proton gradients. We'll then use those for a variety of things. We'll use them in the mitochondria to help make ATP. We'll also use them in vesicles to package neurotransmitters. So the cells need ATP to function. What happens if they don't have enough ATP? Well, they need to stop being so active. So the amount of activity in a cell needs to be <clears throat> related to the amount of ATP that's present. How does this neuron know how much ATP it has? <clears throat> the simplest way to solve this is with potassium channels. So ATP is going to block this 
K-ATP channel. So it's a potassium channel that's sensitive to ATP. These ATP sensitive potassium channels, when ATP levels are high, are going to have very low conductance. So, high ATP, low potassium conductance, thus we're more excitable. Decrease your ATP levels, and by that note, increase your ADP levels. You remove that inhibition, ADP can increase your potassium conductance, and thus you move toward potassium's reversal. So you're less excitable. <clears throat> and that's what we're seeing over here. So when they have, these are beta islet cells, but they're going to fire action potentials too, and they're going to release insulin. So it's the same idea, this is just a really nice illustration, even though they're not neurons, still action potentials. Same principle. When glucose levels are at 5 millimolar, you'll see not a whole lot of activity. And that's because these cells just don't quite have enough glucose to make enough ATP. When they bump it up to 10 millimolar glucose, just look at the traces on the bottom. What you'll notice is that when they increase glucose, that leads to an increase in ATP. And what you see is firing of action potentials to stimulate insulin release. Because now there's glucose around. Since there's glucose, we should release insulin so we can utilize it. So this makes a whole lot of sense. The reason that neurons do it is because if you don't have the ATP to support the action potential, you shouldn't fire it. So when ATP levels drop, become less excitable. And you'll notice on the bottom, there's that inverse relationship between the red trace and the orange trace on the bottom, so the third and fourth traces. So that red one is showing you the amount of ATP relative to ADP, and when that increases, notice that the potassium current decreases, and that coincides with an increase in the activity of these beta islet cells. The same thing is going to be true in neurons. And then when they bump it up further on the right to 20 millimolar glucose, well, of course, ATP levels are going to skyrocket, potassium conductance is going to bottom out, and you're going to see a much higher level of activity. So it's true in neurons, it's true in other areas as well. You've got to be able to pay the bill. <clears throat> so when we bring in glucose, the ultimate goal is to make ATP. And we can think of this as basically a two-step process. There's glycolysis, or anaerobic metabolism, and then there's, uh, well, of course, pyruvate oxidation, and then oxidative phosphorylation, or aerobic metabolism. So anaerobic in the cytoplasm, aerobic in the mitochondria. In anaerobic metabolism, we're breaking down glucose into pyruvate, and in aerobic metabolism, we're breaking down pyruvate into carbon dioxide, and we make a whole lot more ATP. We think of uh, astrocytes as undergoing higher levels of glycolysis and, and neurons as undergoing higher levels of oxidative phosphorylation. They make more ATP because they need to spend more ATP. Now astrocytes are of course going to send out those input processes. They're going to help maintain the blood-brain barrier. This is all true. We've seen this illustration before. And on those input processes they have glucose transporters. So they're connected to the blood, they're also connected to neurons. So if you look at the illustration on top, that's showing you GFAP staining, so we can see astrocytes surrounding a nice blood vessel running through the picture there. And then on the bottom we can see little green astrocytes very close to that red neuron. Here's a cartoon, a little ugly, but it tells the story. You've got a blood vessel there on the right, the astrocyte is going to put the input process down, it's going to pick up glucose from the blood, and it can shuttle it over to neurons. It can also break that glucose down into pyruvate and shuttle that over as well. But certainly we can take glucose out of the blood. Astrocytes have to do that because of their relationship with blood vessels. And they're going to hand it over to neurons. <clears throat> they can hand over glucose. They can also hand over pyruvate or lactate. They're basically the same thing. It's just a one-step enzymatic conversion. So think of them as the same. Pyruvate, lactate. <coughs> pyruvate, lactate, same thing. Okay. So we can pick up glucose or we can just pick up pyruvate or lactate directly from the blood. So we have monocarboxylate transporters that allow us to take that out of the blood. Astrocytes pick it up. They can send that over to neurons. So whether they're making the lactate or pyruvate themselves from glucose or just picking it up from the blood, astrocytes can also transport that to neurons. That pyruvate 
is then going to be used to fuel the TCA cycle. The TCA cycle is going to make a couple of electron carriers, that would be FADH2 and NADH, and these electron carriers donate electrons to the electron transport chain, that's the bottom of this, and that's where we get our big payout, the oxidative phosphorylation. So, regardless of where you're, you're getting it from, what we really care about is pyruvate and lactate because that is what's going to give us the most ATP. When we break that down through the TCA cycle, what we're doing is stripping off electrons and, and when we break apart those bonds, we're liberating carbon dioxide. That's why we breathe that out. So we break down pyruvate into carbon dioxide and the, the electrons that we take away, we transfer to the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. That then fuels ATP synthase, and we make about 30 ATP compared to the net 2 that we get in glycolysis. So the brain is almost exclusively going to be using glucose to fuel its metabolic processes. And again, we think of that because of the respiratory quotient. The amount of oxygen used and carbon dioxide produced is basically the same. We do have alternatives, though. So you don't have to use carbohydrates although the brain would like to, especially in adults. But when we're much younger, we're certainly going to make use of lipids and, and they're, they're metabolized to the ketone bodies. So this is a backup. Neurons can use this. They can take those and make acetyl-CoA, and that's going to go through the TCA cycle, just like we saw on the last slide. Now, you might be wondering, shit, do I need to remember the TCA cycle? You need to remember that it exists and that it makes electron uh, carriers, those reducing agents, NADH and FADH2, but you don't really need to know the enzymes. You can just look that up. It's an impressive feat uh, of, of memory, but no need. Use that for something else more important. You should understand what it produces, not remember all the enzymes. So, we can make acetyl-CoA from fatty acids and ketone bodies. That's going to be used then to make those reducing agents and then a shitload of ATP in the mitochondria. We can also use these to make myelin. So these fuel sources are very important for uh, infants. And this has to do with their diet and what's going on in the brain. Their diet consists of almost exclusively breast milk. Now it might be formula. These are both going to be lipid rich. So they're eating a very fatty diet. So of course they're going to make use of fats. Now there's plenty of sugars in breast milk too, so they'll, they'll take advantage of those. But the high level of fat in their diet is actually a great thing because the, the key thing going on in their brain would be myelination. So now that they've, they have their axons in place, what they need to do is myelinate them. And myelination is going to take place uh, certainly during uh, that, that, that period of development. So when you're an infant, there's a high level of myelination. <clears throat> Luckily, we drink a bunch of breast milk, so we have lipids available to make the myelin. Now in adults, we can still use ketone bodies and lipids. You, you tend not to see this, though, unless you're starving yourself, either of food or of carbohydrates, or you can't properly use carbohydrates, like in the case of diabetes. But in normal, healthy adults with a healthy diet, carbohydrates are going to be the main, glute, uh, the main source of energy for the brain. So when we bring in that, that glucose, the first thing that's going to happen is glycolysis. So when we think of metabolism in a typical cell, we're going to think of bringing in glucose. So now we have glucose in the cell. We're then going to generate pyruvate through glycolysis. So this takes place out in the cytoplasm. <clears throat> Through the pro process of glycolysis, we are going to net two ATP. That's it. So every glucose molecule we break down into two pyruvate molecules, we're going to net two ATP and two pyruvates. The pyruvate is then going to be shuttled into the mitochondria. It's going to be broken down into acetyl-CoA. We're going to go through the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. 
The TCA cycle creates the reducing agents or the electron carriers that are going to fuel oxidative phosphorylation. And what we get here is roughly 30 ATP. You'll see different estimates. <clears throat> but it's somewhere in the ballpark of 30. Whether it's 30, 32, doesn't matter. It's a whole lot more than 2, and that's the point. This is the big payout. Now, the division of labor in a typical cell is that glycolysis is in the cytoplasm, oxidative phosphorylation is in the mitochondria. This is still true in the nervous system, but we tend to see a whole lot more glycolysis carried out in astrocytes and a whole lot more oxidative phosphorylation carried out in neurons. It's not exclusive. It's not 100% glycolysis in astrocytes and 100% oxidative phosphorylation in neurons. But we tend to see more glycolysis in astrocytes and more oxidative phosphorylation in neurons. So again, you don't need to remember this. Some of these enzymes will be brought up again, but you got your notes. You should probably know that uh, phosphofructokinase is going to be an important step in glycolysis. This is one that we're going to regulate later, and it's going to be regulated by ATP levels. <clears throat> so this way the cell knows when it needs to make more ATP. ATP drops, disinhibit it, go through glycolysis, make more ATP. The TCA cycle, all that's going to do is generate our uh, electron carriers, so NADH and FADH2. Those take the electrons that they strip off of pyruvate. So when we break down that pyruvate, it's going to exit as just carbon dioxide. Now pyruvate has three carbons in it. Right, this is a derivative of glucose, which has six carbons. 12 hydrogens, 6 oxygens, it's a carbohydrate, broken down into pyruvate, and then we start to strip off individual carbon molecules, that would be carbon dioxide. And the electrons that held it together are passed through the electron transport chain, and that's what you see at the bottom there. Again, don't worry about remembering these. Just understand basically what's going on in the TCA cycle. We're pulling electrons away from pyruvate so that we can hand them to the uh, electron transport chain. These electrons are going to move through the electron transport chain. You probably remember that they fuel a, a proton pumps. Those proton pumps make a proton gradient. And then those protons move through ATP synthase to create ATP. It's a beautiful system. That production of ATP by ATP synthase occurs through oxidative phosphorylation. And that's where we get our roughly 30 ATP, so the big payout. Now the reason that we think that we have this division of labor is because of data like these, where you compare the level of expression for glycolytic enzymes in astrocytes and neurons, and you actually see a higher level in astrocytes. So there's a few enzymes over there, you can just look at panel B. They've color-coded it to say whether or not there's a higher level of expression in astrocytes. It's going to be red for very uh, high levels, orange moderately higher in astrocytes and neurons, yellow the same, and then green-blue would tell you a little more and a lot more in neurons. And I want you to notice there's, there's no blues over there in panel B, so when you go through glycolysis, most of those are going to be at least yellow, if not orange and red. So we're seeing higher levels of expression for glycolytic enzymes in astrocytes, which suggests that they're probably going to undergo higher levels of glycolysis. And this should make sense. They're the ones contacting the blood vessels. They're going to bring in the glucose in the first place so they have better access to it to start to break it down so that by the time neurons get the pyruvate, they're ready for the big payout. Sure, they miss out on 2 ATP, but they're not wasting time with glycolysis, which is slower. So this is rate limiting. They get to do the high payout oxidative phosphorylation and pay their expensive bills. They got that enormous surface area to volume ratio, so they need the additional ATP. So this picture is going to bring us into the next main point that we get to. Astrocytes are going to shuttle metabolic substrates over to neurons. So they have that high level of glycolytic enzymes. They're also the cells that store uh, glycogen. 
Neurons don't. If you ask them to, ask, uh, by making them express the enzymes needed for this, they die. So neurons don't and can't store glycogen, but astrocytes can and do. So when times get tough, they break down the glycogen into glucose. Maybe they break it down further into pyruvate and lactate and then shuttle that over to neurons. So neurons get what they need from astrocytes. And that makes good sense. Neurons don't contact blood. So we think of this division of labor because of the location of the cells. That is, astrocytes touch the blood vessels, not neurons and the relative expression levels for glycolytic enzymes. <clears throat> so astrocytes then are going to shuttle a few different metabolic substrates over to neurons in an activity dependent manner. Now glutamate is a very important uh, amino acid for neurons. They're going to use it to make proteins but they're also of course going to use it for excitatory neurotransmission. <clears throat> and there's two sources for making glutamate. You can make it from glutamine, so we're going to hit our glutamate glutamine cycle. Astrocytes are going to shuttle over glutamine, and then neurons are going to recycle that to make glutamate. And then you can also use alpha ketoglutarate. This is one of those enzymes in the TCA cycle that you really don't need to remember. It's probably good to know this one, though, because it is one of the substrates to make glutamine. So GABA transaminase is going to make, I'm sorry to make glutamate. GABA transaminase is going to make glutamate from alpha ketoglutarate. So, whenever we do that though, what we're doing is depleting the ability for astrocytes to undergo the TCA cycle and to create reducing agents and drive their own oxidative phosphorylation. So, astrocytes have to be able to replenish the TCA cycle substrates. So, as you're moving through the TCA cycle, you're taking the same molecule and you're just, you're just recycling it. So we can make use of this and we refresh it with that acetyl-CoA that comes in. But if we start to strip away alpha-ketoglutarate and send it over to neurons, we need to be able to make these uh, TCA cycle substrates again. <clears throat> and that uh, is the purpose of the anaplerotic re reactions where astrocytes will take pyruvate and then replenish TCA cycle substrates so they can, they can afford to give away alpha-ketoglutarate to neurons. So one of the things that we're going to shuttle over to neurons is our very own TCA cycle substrates, in particular alpha-ketoglutarate. And this is going to allow neurons to make glutam uh, glutamate without depriving themselves of their alpha-ketoglutarate. Keto, alpha this way, neurons can maintain higher levels of oxidative phosphorylation. This is another piece of evidence that suggests neurons are going to be biased toward oxidative phosphorylations and astrocytes toward glycolysis. That's why astrocytes can afford to give away alpha-ketoglutarate. The other source of uh, glutamate synthesis is glutamine. So, after neurons, I'm sorry, after astrocytes pick up glutamate from the synapse, they convert glutamate to glutamine and send it back. There's a very obvious and important reason for this. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. We want to rapidly clear it from the synapse so that the neurons don't get hyperexcited and die. So we want to have a brief burst of glutamate and then we want our astrocyte over here to pick up that glutamate. We're going to convert it to glutamine, now it's purple, and we can spit that out. That's totally fine. When we spit out glutamine back into the extracellular space, it's not going to stimulate glutamate receptors. Then neurons can pick up glutamine, convert it back to glutamate, and repackage it into vesicles. If we just picked up glutamate and spat it back out, we'd be spinning our wheels and nothing would happen. So, after astrocytes reuptake glutamate, so they've removed it from the synapse, they're going to convert it to glutamine. The enzyme that synthesizes glutamine is called, as luck would have it, glutamine synthetase. That glutamine is sent back over 
It's a one-step reaction then. After neurons pick up glutamine, glutaminase converts it to glutamate. And now you've safely recycled glutamate without having to worry about excitotoxicity. Now, all this excitatory glutamatergic activity is going to, of course, cost us. It's going to cost the neuron. It's also going to cost the astrocyte. <clears throat> the reason that we're able to pick up glutamate is because we're riding along those passive ion uh, 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 currents. Jesus. So we have a lot of sodium outside, a lot of potassium inside. So whenever we pick up glutamate with our excitatory amino acid transporters, I'm going to draw that kind of like a funnel, excitatory amino acid transporters, we're also going to pick up some sodium. So we'll pick up sodium, which is high outside. We'll pick up some protons, and we're going to send out potassium. So we have passive ion movements that are going to drive the uptake of glutamate. This way, we can bias it toward uptake. So we're less likely to get reverse transport. Of course, you'll notice we're bringing in sodium, we're putting out potassium, we're going to need to stimulate our sodium-potassium ATPase. So that has to keep running. This creates work for the sodium-potassium ATPase. ATP levels drop. So when we're bringing in glutamate, what we're doing is depleting the cell of ATP because of the sodium-potassium ATPase. That ATP was inhibiting glycolysis. So the more ATP we have, the lower the rate of glycolysis. When ATP levels drop, we get in, I don't know where I'll be able to fit that, we'll write it up here, an increase in glycolysis. That, of course, produces ATP. It's also going to make pyruvate and lactate that we can then shuttle on over to the neurons because since neurons released glutamate, we know they were active. Since they were active, we know they need ATP. So, through glycolysis, yes, we're making ATP for the astrocyte, but remember, astrocytes take care of neurons, so we're also making pyruvate. Whew. With one A, pyruvate. That's a U, that's a V. That pyruvate is going to get shuttled over through those monocarboxylate transporters, so that the neuron can undergo oxidative phosphorylation. It just released neurotransmitters. This neuron needs some pyruvate. This neuron needs some pyruvate. Everybody have a little pyruvate. That's going to allow us to make our roughly 30 ATP to handle the fairly expensive postsynaptic potentials as well as the release of neurotransmitter. Now remember, we might not make uh, proteins here, but we definitely make ATP. We have mitochondria in our axons. So this is what we call the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle. Astrocytes are going to shuttle lactate over to neurons, and then those neurons will convert uh, lactate over to pyruvate, and they'll undergo oxidative phosphorylation. <clears throat> now, if we're going to go through all this, that means we have to have excellent blood supply to this region that's active. And of course, nerve cells are going to be able to communicate not just with each other, but also with the blood vessels so that we can scale the amount of blood flow with that of brain activity. So when we have an increase in neural activity, we're going to see an increase in blood flow. And this is the big idea behind functional MRI. When a brain region is active, we see a change in blood flow, and there's going to be a change in the amount of uh, um, oxidated hemoglobin. And that's going to be detected differently in a T2-weighted MRI. So what we're seeing over here in this cartoon is somebody looking at a visually stimulating image. So their primary visual cortex is, of course, going to be highly active. You see an increase in blood flow, an increase in glucose use as a result, and more oxygen. That is really what we're going to pick up with the uh, functional MRI. And the reason that you're seeing an in increase in blood flow is because you have vasodilation. That's what the green arrows are showing you. So in those data, uh, they electrically stimulated the nerve cells near that blood vessel, and when they stimulated them, dilation. 
when they inhibited activity of the neurons, vasoconstriction. So we're able to scale the amount of blood flow based on how much activity we have. And there's a variety of ways that this occurs. There's a number of signaling molecules that we're going to walk through. So, all of the energy that we create in our nervous system is ultimately derived from the blood. We eat food, food is broken down, the, the, the glucose, uh, lipids, uh, those are going to enter the blood and get transported to the brain. Astrocytes will pick it up and they'll shuttle it over to neurons, either as glucose or pyruvate or whatever it may be. Now, the neurons, when they're active, can directly communicate with the blood vessels through the creation of nitric oxide. So when neurons are active, what's going to happen here is an increase in calcium. That's what's driving neurotransmitter release. So when we fire the action potential, voltage-gated calcium channels let calcium come in. That calcium is going to stimulate neurotransmitter release. It's also going to stimulate <coughs> neuronal nitric oxide synthase. It synthesizes nitric oxide and is found in neurons. That nitric oxide then freely diffuses through membranes. And when it encounters uh, the, the vascular smooth muscle cells, it causes them to relax. When they relax, you get vasodilation. <clears throat> Astrocytes are also going to communicate with blood vessels. So, again, they have input processes surrounding the blood vessels, so they're very closely uh, uh, in contact with the blood vessel. They're also, of course, sending their perisynaptic processes to sense when neurons are communicating at synapses. So they're, uh, they're an ideal middleman for relaying synaptic activity to the blood vessel. And astrocytes can regulate both ways. So first they have to be able to sense when neurons are active, and they have a few ways of doing that. So they're going to pick up glute, uh, glutamate in glutamate transporters, they can also sense glutamate levels via glutamate receptors. So these won't be your AMPA and NMDA receptors, except when they are. Uh, but in this case, what we're dealing with are metabotropic glutamate receptors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Metabotropic glutamate receptors. You've probably heard of MGLUARs before. Now, what these are going to do is stimulate phospholipase. And phospholipase is just an enzyme that cuts phospholipids. And different types are going to cut at different sites. Now, the particular phospholipase activated here is phospholipase A2. This is going to create arachidonic acid. So it's going to cut phospholipids in the membrane, and it's going to liberate from there arachidonic acid. So when we create arachidonic acid, that can leave, I guess we need a blood vessel on here, that can leave and encounter the that's going to look inappropriate. Let's see here. Let's see if we can do that. There we go. That's probably safer. That arachidonic acid can then cause uh, vasodilation. So the arachidonic acid is going to be metabolized. And we're going to make uh, a, a couple different signaling molecules. <clears throat> Eats and the prostaglandins. You've probably heard of prostaglandins before. So these are going to be created during inflammation, for example, and they're going to contribute to that redness that you get. Whenever you have an injury, the surrounding tissue will turn red because of an increase in blood flow. So prostaglandins, which we're thinking of with inflammation, increase blood flow, and they're going to do that through vasodilation. So the arachidonic acid is converted to either EATS or your prostaglandins, and these will dilate our blood vessels. Now, of course, you can't forget homeostasis. All right, so when you, when you have vasodilation, you also need some sort of vasoconstrictive uh, break to stop that. So the vasodilation will be the gas. Let's increase blood flow, vasoconstriction. Let's dilate it. 
So the arachidonic acid is, can, uh, can also be exported from the astrocytes. Now if the arachidonic acid itself leaves, and rather than being metabolized first, is taken up by the vascular uh, smooth muscle cells, they metabolize it and they make something different. They're going to make 20 heat, which is actually going to then stimulate the muscle cell and cause constriction. So when there's conversion within the muscle cell, we're going to get constriction. So the arachidonic acid that's produced can be metabolized to form vasodilators, or if it's exported directly, it's going to form vasoconstrictors within the vascular smooth muscle cells. <clears throat> now during periods where we have hypoxia, and we definitely need to have an increase in blood flow so we can get more oxygen, when we have hypoxia and we can't undergo oxidative phosphorylation, that pyruvate or that lactate is going to build up. We need oxygen in order to break down pyruvate and lactate through oxidative phosphorylation. So in hypoxic or anaerobic conditions, no more aerobic metabolism, and we get a buildup of lactate. So drop our oxygen, buildup of lactate. So that buildup of extracellular lactate is going to boost our prostaglandin levels. So it's going to increase that vasodilating signal. And it's going to do that by preventing reuptake. So lactate is going to be a prostaglandin reuptake inhibitor. So when oxygen levels are low, the buildup of lactate leads to a buildup of prostaglandins. That then increases the vasodilatory signal to our uh, smooth muscle vascular cells. So we get vasodilation and an increase in blood flow so that hopefully we can boost those oxygen levels again. Now when um, Whenever we have high levels of astrocyte activity as a result of neuron activity, we should hopefully remember that astrocytes don't fire action potentials. What they do instead is have those calcium waves. So when we have calcium waves going on in astrocytes, this is going to lead <coughs> to potassium efflux. And this brings us back to those nifty calcium-sensitive potassium channels. So we have our calcium wave because of a high level of activity. That's going to cause potassium efflux. Now here's the weird thing. <clears throat> if we increase extracellular potassium levels, this is of course going to depolarize potassium's reversal. So what you would think is that that would cause us to depolarize our vascular smooth muscle cells, but that is not what we see. So let's walk through these data first and then we'll explain them. So if we look on top, we're looking at the diameter of a blood vessel. They do, uh, again, electrical stim of the, the nervous tissue around it, and they see, of course, vasodilation, unless they add barium in the bath, and barium is going to block potassium channels. So clearly potassium plays an important role in determining whether or not blood vessels are going to dilate. Of course, neurons are going to spit out potassium whenever they're highly active. Astrocytes are going to spit out potassium whenever they're highly active. So whether we're getting potassium efflux from astrocytes or neurons, let me get this out of the way, because of action potentials in neurons or calcium waves in astrocytes, that buildup of extracellular potassium causes vasodilation. And it does that by hyperpolarizing smooth muscle cells. This shouldn't make sense. The reversal potential is going to depolarize. Why does the cell hyperpolarize? 
and that's because of a massive increase in the permeability for potassium. So even though our reversal depolarizes a bit, you'll notice that these, these muscle cells are resting at fairly depolarized potentials, minus 40. The reversal for potassium is still well below that, even after we depolarize it a bit with this increase in extracellular potassium. So yeah, we depolarize the reversal, but we more than offset that by bumping up the permeability for potassium. So when that, the vascular smooth muscle cells there sense an increase in extracellular potassium, they're going to insert additional potassium channels into the membrane. That's how you can think of it. It's kind of a lie. The potassium channels that are there just have a higher level of conductance. I don't know why I lied about that. Anyway, we get an increase in potassium permeability in our vascular smooth muscle cells. And that is what causes hyperpolarization, and that is what then leads to vasodilation. So, neurons can spit out nitric oxide, they can also spit out potassium. Astrocytes can spit out a number of arachidonic acid metabolites. That's going to be stimulated by neuronal activity, so when we release glutamate, MGLUARs uh, create arachidonic acid, and then depending on what else is going on out there in the world, for example, are you a little hypoxic, do you have some lactate buildup, well that's going to bias us toward prostaglandin uh, signaling and thus vasodilation. <clears throat> so we can have vasodilation when neurons and astrocytes are more active, and this way we get activity dependent changes in blood flow. We also get activity dependent changes in glucose uptake. So the amount of uptake that the astrocyte is able to I'm sorry, the amount of glucose that the astrocyte is able to pick up depends on how much is outside and how much is inside. So, again, whenever we have the release of glutamate at a synapse, our astrocyte here is going to have our little glucose transporter here to take that up. Of course, it rides along those three, sodium, the proton, there's a potassium that leaves, these come in. <clears throat> that then stimulates the sodium-potassium ATPase, and that drops ATP levels. We then go through glycolysis, because we disinhibit phosphofructokinase, and we're going to go through glycolysis. We break down glucose. So glucose levels drops. The parentheses is going to be a little weird. When we, undergo, when we undergo glycolysis, we decrease the amount of glucose. So now we have less glucose inside. When we remove glucose from the inside, it then facilitates the uptake of glucose from the blood. So we essentially create a glucose sink so then our glutes, the glucose transporters, can more readily transport glucose from the blood back into the astrocyte and keep this whole system going. <clears throat> so the big story here is really that connection between neurons, astrocytes, and blood vessels. We want to be able to regulate blood vessels, and well, we want to be able to regulate the size of blood vessels and thus blood flow based on how active neurons are, because they're very, very expensive. We facilitate uh, the paying of their expensive bills through astrocytes, which take up blood, I'm sorry, take up glucose from the blood in an activity-dependent manner, break it down into the, the readily uh, um, oxidizable pyruvate or lactate, send that over, neurons undergo oxidative phosphorylation and make a bunch of ATP. And every time they're active, they can directly communicate to the blood, but they can also act through that astrocyte middleman or middlewoman, depending on how you want to think about it. And that's how we pay the bill. Nothing's free. But what is free is uh, my answers to your questions. So if you have any, fill out those questions box. I'll see you in class.